what's called a motion or a proposition. And in formal debates, a motion is always it always begins with the three words, this house believes, okay? So the proposition is, this house believes that collaboration is the only way to survive the digital disruption in financial services. Okay, so in favor of that motion, Doug and Zach will be speaking. Against it, Robert and Lena will be speaking. And the important thing is to persuade you, because who wins this debate depends on what you think, right? So at the very beginning, actually, we're going to take a straw poll just to see what the, what the mood of the meeting is, to see what your prior is, if you like. But the result will depend on the vote at the end. That's if I can actually see hands going up with these, with these, with, with these lights, OK? So now, here's the format. We'll take the straw poll at the beginning. Then the first proposition speaker, who is Doug, will speak for four minutes, and exactly four minutes. Then we'll have the same from the first opposition speaker. Then back to the second speaker on this side, Zach, for four minutes. Then back to the second speaker over here, who will be Lena, for four minutes. Okay? Then each side gets three minutes in the same order as what's called a rebuttal. And those three minutes can be, can be divided between the two speakers on each side as they see fit. Right. Then you have to do some work. We have 15 minutes, maximum of 15 minutes, for Q&A. And exactly how we're going to do that will depend on how many questions we get. But it's your job at that point. So when, these, when they're, they're talking, you've got to be thinking of questions to ask or points to make. And then I, I, I as the chairman, will pick out people to speak, and you can make your point. Whether they deal with it immediately or afterwards just depends on the, the flow of debate we get out on the floor, OK? After that, the proposition will speak for two minutes, closing remarks. The opposition will speak for two minutes, closing remarks. Then we'll have the closing vote, and that'll be all over. Now, is that all clear? Right. <laughs> thought, it, thought it was. Thought it was. I've done my job. So. Now, again, just before we start, I want to give the t the, all the speakers a chance just to introduce themselves, because all I've done so far is told you their names and, and who they work for. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Doug Russell. I'm a managing director at Mass Mutual Venture Capital. We're a $100 million fintech and suretech focused fund, and we are part of Mass Mutual, the 160-year-old life insurance company. Delighted to be here. Zach. Hey there, I'm Zach Perret, co-founder and CEO of Plaid. Uh, Plaid is an infrastructure provider. We build uh, the platform layer that powers fintech. So we sit at the interface between financial institutions and financial technology firms, building that platform layer, that information exchange layer. Robert. Good afternoon. I'm Robert Faruknia. I'm faculty member at Columbia Business School and a School of Engineering. I also teach at the School of Journalism. Uh, I'm the founder of uh, a program at Columbia focused on applied research and advanced projects in fintech. And lastly, I'm also the founder of a development lab uh, in New York. And Lena. Thank you. Lena Mascresnik, I'm based at BlackRock here in New York City, a five plus trillion dollar asset manager. I head up our global innovation around strategic product uh, management focused on investment products. Excited to be here. Okay. Thank you to all of you. And I should also say the long timing, I meant to be pretty strict. Okay, so if it gets to, if people have got four minutes, it gets to four minutes. You, you'll get a warning, and then if you talk for too many seconds after that, it, it's over, OK? So let's make a start. OK, the motion before the House is this House believes that collaboration is the only way to survive the digital disruption in financial services. Let's take a straw poll. How many people agree with the motion, agree with that proposition? How many people oppose it? I think that says we have a fairly substantial majority in favour. You've got your work cut out, guys. <laughs> but, OK, let's get started. And we have the first speaker for the motion, please. Well, of course, collaboration is the only way to survive the digital age in financial services. Zach, it's a real pleasure to be working with you this afternoon, partnering on this topic. Digital, it's so many things to so many people. For some, it's about technology. Others, others, it's about ways to engage customers in new and different ways. Still, some see it as an innovative way to conduct business. For Mass Mutual Ventures, we see it as that and then some. 
What I truly believe distinguishes and gives a digital enterprise a competitive advantage, yes, competitive advantage, is its culture, strategy, and way of operating. A World Economic Forum white paper asserts that digital enterprises are always striving to enable new and leaner operating models. These models are bolstered by agile business processes, platforms, and most importantly, collaboration capabilities. In the digital age, collaboration tools are a significant enabler in openness. And openness correlates to engagement, innovation, happiness, and ultimately success. In less than five years, millennials will make up 90% of the workforce, and almost 50% uh, of the workforce, excuse me, and, and almost 90% of them say they prefer an environment that's collaborative to one that's competitive. Bill Gates himself has said that creativity is less an individual characteristic than it is an emergent property, one that surfaces when people convene around a common problem. A Deloitte study notes that two-thirds of workers who believe their company have a culture of openness are working in an environment where the infrastructure supports that openness. In 2013, President Obama issued an executive order expanding his administration's open government policy, requiring agencies to make government data open and machine readable. The initiative carried with it two primary objectives. One, to fuel economic growth and innovation, and two, to make open machine readable the new default. Organizations today operate in a world of increasing complexity and specialization. A 2010 Callaway Leadership Institute study notes, it's extremely rare for a single company to have all the essential resources it needs to accomplish its goals. Business owners must develop the ability to collaborate and cooperate effectively in order to be successful. This leads to benefits not only for the customers, but for employees in those firms as well. What makes collaboration critical in the digital age is that technology has blurred industry lines. No longer is the playing field a neat one, with companies staying within those industry lines. Companies not ready for disruption from new entrants are in danger of extinction. And we see this every single day at Mass Mutual Ventures, new entrepreneurs looking to dislodge the incumbents. Mass Mutual, our parent company, is a 166-year-old company. And as a product, life insurance looks pretty much the same today as it did 150 plus years ago. But it's how we interact with our policy owners that's different today. We delivered our first insurance policy in 1851 on a horseback. Today, people expect our customer service to be prompt as Amazon's, results in quick as, as quick and as accurate as Google's. And to meet these expectations, we as a firm are collaborating and participating in ways that we never imagined four or five years ago. In closing, and with a nod to Tesla CEO Elon Musk, who in a recent article talked about collaboration with respect to open AI, he indicated it's better to get super AI first and distribute it to the world rather than concealing and con concentrating it in the hands of few. While many leaders may see themselves as forces for good, he comments that it's fine when the emperor is Marcus Aurelius, not so fine when the emperor is Caligula. Open and honest collaboration is the only way to survive digital disruption. Thank you. Applause is allowed, by the way. We want to get some atmosphere going. Thank you. Thanks very much, Doug. And right on four minutes as well. That was absolutely perfect timing. Robert, for, uh, against the motion, please. Excellent, thank you. I shall be, I shall be on point, uh, given the fact that I'm the last thing remaining between you, dinner, and uh, from what I understand is the raffling of a, of a Ferrari, uh, courtesy of IBM, but only if we <laughs> win. Isn't that right, Bob? Sure. Excellent. So, um, in, while collaboration seems like a no-brainer and certainly a politically correct term, it fails to capture the reality uh, in today's world of rapid creative destruction. Uh, given the role I have at the intersection of academia and practice, I would be remiss in my duties if I do not uh, debunk what I believe to be a half myth. And in doing so, we humbly will also offer you a roadmap to survive the digital disruption. So the premise of our debate, when analyzed uh, from the perspective of a big company or startup or even uh, governmental bodies or regulators, rests on the fundamental assumption that collaboration is the default and natural state of companies. And they choose to engage in it freely. Economic theory and empirical evidence suggest otherwise. 
Now, I believe we can all agree on the very fact that uh, the, the very, pre the very uh, for, uh, goal of any company in our system, in the economic system, is to maximize market share, revenues, profit, and ideally even economic rent if you can get away with it. As such, the default state of most, if not all companies, is to compete at all costs and compete fiercely all, uh, against all challengers and contenders. After all, if your reward depends on, the, uh, on your growth and financial outcomes, you have no choice but to outcompete everyone else. Collaboration is not the first thing on your mind. So by extension, companies begin contemplating collaboration only when they are forced to, when they first need to be subdued, overwhelmed, and even humbled by competition, uh, and then they would collaborate only then. And to, make my, this, uh, to bring the point home, I'll, I'll make a simple analogy. Now, you don't have to be a combinatorial game theorist to appreciate the complexity of the game of chess and how many, uh, uh, and the overwhelming number of, of uh, positions and, and moves one can make on, on, on chess. You can also say that chess is somewhat similar to, to strategy and corporate strategy. So when playing chess in order to win, or at least not to lose, uh, you have to obviously pay attention and anticipate what your opponent will make in the next five, six, or seven moves. That obviously sounds all great, but the problem is that as you're anticipating that many moves far ahead, the number of combinations and permutations of possible moves and positions becomes incredibly complex. You're dealing with numbers with many, many zeros. So you do the sensible thing and they start making decision trees. Uh, you assign probability and, and, and weighted outcomes to uh, all these uh, branches. And you start reducing complexity by pruning these so-called branches to kind of see what do you think it's not going to happen, and you eliminate that. Well, um, the problem is if you prune wrong, you're, you're, you're in a lot of trouble. And I don't need to remind you of BlackBerry and Kodak and, and, and Blockbuster as examples of companies that pruned wrong. So in a system that fosters competition, you're increasing the number of op opponents you're playing simultaneously chess with. And the number of possible branches obviously grows exponentially. So at that point, the practical choice is to start cooperating and collaborating to increase the odds of survival and uh, figure out a way to reduce variables and number of branches you have to deal with. So the bottom line is, without competition, there will not be collaboration, whereas the other way around doesn't occur much, if at all. Collaboration can coexist with competition, as the latter is a precursor to the former, but collaboration per se does not occur naturally. So I submit, with good talent, we need to encourage and increase competition internally and engage in it externally, innovate and confound the big players to commit errors, and only then you have a shot at surviving in the jungle of business warfare. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Perfect timing once again. I should say, we've got a clock down here, a digital clock. And what we didn't tell you is actually the last 30 seconds, it just speeds up that little bit. So, um, <laughs> um, Zach, seconding the motion. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so, as I mentioned previously, I'm Zach, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Plaid, and as you can probably tell by my genes, I am uh, here as a representative of Silicon Valley. Uh, so, uh, I'm honored today to be on stage here beside Mass Mutual, um, a financial institution with a, a long and storied history of partnerships. Um, at Plaid, our mission is to enable innovation in financial services. Uh, we're focused on helping consumers and businesses live more responsible uh, and more, more fully-fledged financial lives, and we do so by enabling businesses to innovate and create new tools and services in the financial world. Our business is built on collaboration, and we've worked with hundreds of financial institutions and hundreds of financial applications uh, to create new tools and services for consumers over the past five years. So partnership is essential to success in an internet-enabled financial world. The demands of consumers and businesses on our financial system are ever-increasing. And the best way for us to keep up is to build an open, inclusive, and collaborative environment. We already live in a world with significant partnership. For years, we've relied on third-party services to manage aspects of our financial lives. We've relied on things like payroll providers to send us paychecks each month. We've relied on brokers to help us make our investments. We've relied on accountants to help us do our taxes or do our bookkeeping. And many of us have mortgages, loans, uh, and credit cards that are issued by financial institutions where we don't hold our primary checking account. For any of this to work, uh, there has to be a collaboration between the different services that are being provided to us and the financial institutions themselves. And sometimes this means collaboration between banks, sometimes this means collaboration between banks and non-banks. In recent years, we've seen a couple major trends emerge that underscore the importance of collaboration. 
The first is a shift to online and increasingly to mobile banking. Uh, we live in a post-branch world uh, where consumers and businesses prefer to do their banking online or via mobile apps uh, instead of going into a branch. We've seen a lot of branch closures as well uh, over the past 10 years. It's something like more than 5,000 branches have closed. 60% 60, 60 of consumers uh, use online banking weekly, and 35% of consumers prefer to use mobile banking exclusively. Yet double, a double-digit percentage of small and medium-sized banks still don't have websites. So it's clear that in order for the financial system and these small and medium-sized banks to actually progress to a state where consumers want to continually use them, we have to collaborate. And the collaboration has to happen both between the banks and the non-banks. The second change is an increasing reliance on the checking account as the hub and the center of our financial life, but not necessarily the layer of interaction. The average consumer in the United States has more than 15 things connected to their bank account. Everything from utility bills, subscriptions, insurance payments, loans, mortgages, credit cards, payroll, investment accounts, budgeting tools, and accounting tools are all connected to our bank accounts. Um, a bank account connection is, a fundam is fundamental to each of these tools and services, but these services likewise are fundamental to the well-being of the consumer. So as we think about financial services and how it evolves in a digital age, the key here is to focus on the consumer and make sure that they still get the tools and services they need as their demands continue to increase. The idea of partnerships between financial institutions and non-bank financial applications is already commonplace, and we've relied on it for decades. It's clear that a financial system without collaboration would be a major hindrance to the financial well-being of most consumers and most businesses in the United States. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Zach. And uh, Lena, to uh, wind up for the uh, opposition, four minutes. Thank you. So in the opening, I'm going to focus on two key themes. The first is the economics of innovation competition, and the second is around uh, serving clients as a fiduciary and doing the best that we can for our clients. So in the first theme, I'd ask you to think back to the Fortune 500 companies that existed back in 1955 and compare those to those that existed in 2016. Only 12% actually remained. And this is partly attributable to a phenomenon called creative destruction. So Joseph Schumpeter, a very famous and renowned economist and political scientist, had coined this phrase in his seminal bestseller, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. And in this, he essentially created uh, the notion of creative destruction, where he describes capitalism as the perennial gale of capital, excuse me, of creative destruction. And it has become a centerpiece of modern thinking of how modern economies evolve. Essentially, companies demonstrate patterns and trends around uh, destruction and rebirth. So Schumpeter's vision of competition was very much that of a destructive process in which effort, assets, and uh, fortunes were continuously destroyed by innovation. This endless process actually displaced technologies that were older and made the way for newer technologies to come through that led to much further growth and much greater growth than those of stable, perhaps more conservative alternatives. So think back to the steam engine, the emergence of the automobile, microprocessors, for example. Now, let's fast forward to a more modern day example, and I'm gonna focus on uh, an industry outside of finance, and specifically the film industry. So if we think of Kodak, everyone knows, this, you know, is very familiar with the story. What's interesting is many people don't know that in 2001, they published a report. There was a group of people that published a report on info imaging. And they projected that about $225 billion could be made in this info imaging market. It is at the convergence of image science and technology merging together. It's what we call today digital photography. Unfortunately, when they presented this to executives, they did not receive the support necessary to progress with this proposal. And in fact, it was shelved and you know, probably collecting dust somewhere. Now, fast forward to 2006, and we saw the emergence of Flickr. And shortly thereafter, the exponential growth of Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Snapchat. So the urgency to innovate was really driven by exponential growth, and more importantly, what is the cost of not competing to innovate? What was the cost of not competing to innovate for Kodak? As many of you know, they actually filed for bankruptcy uh, in January of 2012. Shifting now to the second theme of serving clients as a fiduciary, here we're trying to make the point that as financial institutions, it is our role and responsibility to serve our clients to the best of our ability as fiduciaries as they achieve their outcome-oriented goals. Now, to do that, we deal with products and services. Those are very competitively performance-based which only can then enable and coexist with collaboration. 
How would you identify your collaborators? How do you identify products and services that you're going to purchase? Take the asset management industry, for example. We deal very often with, I work in product innovation, we deal with mutual funds. There are rating agencies like Morningstar and Lipper that actually look at the holistic, comprehensive performance of a particular product. And that allows transparency into the market for people to determine which they will actually pay for and which they will actually uh, adopt. If you shift to the delivery-based system that we're seeing today, I know we've heard from Wealthfront earlier in the robo-advice or digital advice space, how are robo-advisors competing? We know that many financial institutions are working and collaborating with those robo-advisors, but how do they pick their collaborators in that process? And of the many robo-advisors, I think someone quoted earlier, there's hundreds you know, in this space, how will we determine who the winners are? Are they not competing on fees, performance, user experience? These are the types of measures and metrics that are very important as we think through competition. And essentially, competition is and can coexist with collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, very, very nicely timed. Now, the next stage is what's called the rebuttals. So the idea here is that each side takes on the arguments that they've just heard from the other. Um, and there's three minutes aside, which can be divided as they wish. So, how are you, how are you guys going to yep. do it? Okay, Zach. To start off with, let's, let's explore the prompt just a little bit. Um, just because we say that collaboration is good for the financial services ecosystem does not, not mean that we're putting competition on trial. Competition can exist with collaboration, but it's fundamental that collaboration must exist in order for us to progress. Um, collaboration also does not come at the cost of innovation. Uh, we started off by exploring some of the increasing consumer demands, the shift to mobile, the shift to online, the changes and the stresses that consumers are increasingly putting on our financial institutions. It's clear that we will have to innovate in order to keep up with that because our consumers are demanding it. Uh, that does not mean that collaboration will necessarily stop that innovation. In fact, that's just a way to facilitate it and make it go faster. Let's also just delve into a little bit about the types of collaboration that can exist. First is collaboration between banks uh, and other banks. Second is between banks and non-banks. And then third is between non-banks and non-banks. Um, and all of these, these kind of types of collaboration are essential for us to, to live and scale our existing financial system. So today, the, the idea of partnership and collaboration between financial institutions and the broader financial ecosystem has been called into question. But for a moment, let's take a look back at some of the great collaborations um, that serve as the bedrock to much of our current financial system. There are a few examples, uh, one being Visa. Uh, a second being the ACH network that come to mind immediately. Both of these systems were born out of collaborations between the banks um, and uh, amongst many other institutions in the industry. And now these two process the majority, or if not the majority, then a substantial portion uh, of the payments uh, in our ecosystem today. Another collaboration is early warning systems. And many of us may have used this product without even knowing that we've used it, um, which has helped save billions in check fraud. Without a history of collaboration, our financial system fundamentally wouldn't be where it is today. Let's pause and imagine a world maybe without collaboration. In this world, we would immediately lose many of the tools and services that we rely on day to day, including payroll, uh, non-bank lenders, payment networks, accounting services, so on and so forth, that we just discussed previously. What a burden that would be for consumers. We lose many of the tools and services fundamental to our own financial lives. And as a financial institution, the financial institutions would lose many of the ways that they actually interact with their consumers. Moreover, a world without collaboration would result in a consolidation of access and functionality to those banks that have the most advanced technology platforms. In the US, we have just over 6,000, or just under 6,000 FDIC insured financial institutions, and many more community banks and credit unions. These banks actually rely on collaborative partnerships with technology providers such as FIS, Jack Henry, and Fiserv to build their cores, and many other technology providers to build the consumer interface on their mobile apps and their websites. Without collaboration, these financial institutions would all but cease to be able to do business. So it's clear that increasing collaboration must occur between technology partners and financial institutions. To sum it up, banking has a long history of collaboration, and many of the products of these collaborations serve as the as the foundation to our current financial system. As we look ahead, it's clear that a collaborative environment wrap up. is essential to continue to serve the consumer, especially as the technological and user demands continue to increase. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mark. Now, before um, we hear the rebuttal arguments for the uh, opposition, I just want to prime you, because your section is coming up. So the more questions you can think of to make the following 10 minutes as lively and as interesting as we can, uh, the better. So, uh, 
it's a, you, you're doing a lot, Robert. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Okay. So I think my esteemed opponents are confusing uh, collaboration with dependency. Yes, co community banks might be relying on Jack Henry's after all, or five serves after all. They have no, they have no other choice. There is no other company providing the core services for these community banks because the Jack Henry's of the world and Fiserv, they have done everything to quash competition. I think we should not underestimate the power of established legacies and entrenched systems and interest in financial services world. After all, it's one of the oldest professions around. I used to jokingly refer to banking as the second oldest profession until one of my good colleagues corrected me and said, do you know why it's the second oldest? I asked why, tell me. He goes, well, someone had to finance it. <laughs> so the uh, notion of collaboration, as I alluded to before, doesn't come natural to, 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 to banks. And in fact, the very company that, that Zach is leading right now kind of is standing on the shoulders of another company called Yodli. Uh, Yodli came to be because of the exact example I've mentioned before. The com big companies pruned wrong, and they did not think that you know, services provided by Yodli uh, would be valuable until they realized it was too late, and they tried to shut it down and restrict access, and that didn't work. And after a long story, um, um, they had to kind of give up. But even st if still, they're giving you guys trouble. You can't access all their uh, customer accounts all the time. They kind of restrict you at the times they can, you, can, you can log in and you know, take advantage of the servers. So again, collaboration doesn't come natural to firms. You have to force them. And, and again, as Zach Companies has done, uh, uh, but providing a you know, variety of services and banks kind of realizing, well, we, we kind of stayed uh, in, in our ways of doing things, and if we did the same thing over and over again for a long time, well, now finally it comes to realization we have to get up to speed. And even Douglas uh, had the good fortune of, 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 uh, of, of having a debriefing with uh, a Mass Mutual CEO and one of their board members back in 2013, and afterwards they launched Mass Mutual Ventures. And if you think about it, Mass Mutual is a company that's over 160 years old. Uh, but only recently, over the past three, four years, they, they started really in earnest pursuing this, you know, setting up a venture capital firm and, and, and pursuing potential collaboration only because they were forced to. So without fostering competition, without subduing the big companies, forcing their hands, you really have little ch shot at, at, at in, number one, innovation, and number two, at kind of teaming up with these folks and being able to leverage the best of both worlds. Because we all know, as we alluded to before, the startups are very good at innovating and moving fast. Big companies are very good at scaling, and they have a lot of customer relationships. It does, logically, on paper, it makes perfect sense to put these two and two together. But uh, it, that doesn't happen very easily for a variety of reasons. And I look forward to discussing it more, including the notion of talent that came up before. Uh, but we leave that to the audience to decide. So thank you. Thank you very much. Right, let's, uh, let's open things up. Now, I don't think we're, we're scheduled to do 15 minutes. I think it's go actually going to be uh, quite a bit shorter than that. But let's get as much um, out of this as we yeah, can. Yeah. Now, the points you make, they can be directed to individual speakers, or they can be general points that you think ought to be addressed in this discussion. As many of both types as we can, we can possibly get. So who'd like to go first? Sir, the back there. Hello. So this is to the uh, proposition, Doug and Zach. Um, so I, I had two-part question. First part is, do you feel that NASA is a collaborative organization? I'm not sure I know NASA well enough to be able to respond to whether it's a collaborative organization, but I would um, submit that one of the ways we made it to the moon uh, when President Kennedy uh, laid out the objective was through a collaboration across multi-agencies. Would you concede that if the Russians weren't getting so close that NASA, that NASA could have actually beat them to that moon landing? Science. That, that assumes it's a zero-sum game. So one of the, the interesting points there is uh, NASA is simultaneously a competitive organization. And in that context, uh, the US was competing perhaps with other countries, but also collaborative. Uh, so if you look at what they're doing today, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I believe that they're actually buying rockets from, from a number of the other companies that are, in some sense, competing with NASA. But a lot of those are homegrown companies, companies like, uh, like SpaceX, for example, where they're buying their rockets and they're running their rockets while also, in some sense, competing with them. Uh, so it's clear that collaboration has to happen for us to all progress forward. May and, I add oh, a point yeah, absolutely. Just to, yeah. to, to, to the gentleman's question? So Tom Friedman had a, 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 a presentation one day. He was talking about this very story when the Russians launched Sputnik. 
And he was telling us the story that he and a friend of his were in a classroom uh, when they were little kids. And the professor and the teacher actually come, comes to the classroom looking really dour and telling everyone, listen, everybody, uh, the Russians are leaping ahead of us. Uh, from now on, we have to all become very serious. We have to study very hard. We need to become really good at math and, and, and engineering and so on and so forth. So there was this collective drive to, to become a better nation because we felt we were falling behind uh, the Russians or the Soviets at that point. So indeed, I do feel that, that you know, the Soviets uh, launching first into space was the kind of kick that we needed to bring all our resources together and do all the great things we did in the 60s and the 70s that we kind of forgot as a nation how to do big things nowadays. <clears throat> but notice my esteemed colleague's word choice of the word collective or collaborative. Next, next question. Only in the context of being beaten by competition first. <laughs> this is uh, around, I think the fundamental premise that collaboration existed for centuries, co competition existed for centuries, partnerships existed for centuries. But there's something fundamental about this age and uh, the digital world that uh, skills and capabilities are so fragmented and so specialized that to deliver a solution, you need perhaps need more collaboration. Can either of you comment on what specifically in today's age derives, uh, drives more collaboration or less? <clears throat> So I'll, I'll jump in here, yeah, sure. only because I think this is actually something that we've touched on and then asked the question as well. So I think talent is a critical theme that we're talking about. As you talked about the skills, capacity, capabilities, I, I, would, I would actually ask and maybe even poll the audience if we can, how many people would admit that they're not competing for talent? Not competing. So, I mean, in this day and age, even, even in the midst of collaboration, there is competition there's fierce competition among institutions in various industries, not just financial services, as well as competition within organizations when it comes to talent. And I draw on examples like LinkedIn, Facebook, even at BlackRock we run hackathons and hack days where you encourage people to work together, of course, or you know, individuals to submit ideas, but we're really looking for the best ideas. What is the next new disruptive idea? That's coming from contests where people can either gain exposure, recognition, transparency, even monetary incentives. But that underlies coming to some form of kind of the next new big idea, which is still driven by talent. And so if you think about the competitive landscape, that I think is really critical <clears throat> to the question that you're asking, and that's where it's derived, is people. And I would argue that it's how one competes for that talent. I think one needs to establish a culture and a mindset of collaborating with his employees. So you, you touch on the fact that you run hackathons. That, by its definition, is a collaborative you know, problem-solving session where people with different backgrounds, skills, et cetera, come together to, to uh, create or uh, solve a common problem. I'd also submit that the companies that we look at to invest in many of the business, and to your point about the digital age, we have companies that are established here in the United States but have developers that are worldwide and that are collaborating, working across time zones, geographies, uh, languages, and cultures. And again, it's enabled because of the tech, some of the tools that are available from a collaboration standpoint, but it speaks to the, the need to attract talent, but also the way businesses are operating. They're operating in a much different way today than, than years ago. So just one more point on, on, on that front. Um, it's, it's important to underscore that competition is not on trial here today. Uh, what we're focused on is collaboration. So should collaboration exist in financial services in order to make the digital transition? Um, without collaboration in the past, we wouldn't have many of, of the, the, the fundamental underpinnings of technology that we have today. We would have no internet. We'd have no web. We've had no online standards. Um, we wouldn't have had a lot of the uh, kind of core innovators uh, that built a lot of the technology tools that we use today. So uh, fundamentally, things like Bell Labs and Xerox PARC, where a lot of our, our newest innovations came out of at the time, uh, those were collaborative environments that were put together in order to generate new tools and services. So as we think about how digital is changing everything for consumers and businesses, what we can see is that the demands are going up significantly on our existing institutions. And without going forward in a collaborative environment, there's no way that we can pr progress to meet those consumer demands. Actually, I, I respectfully disagree the fact that competition is not on trial, it is on trial. We're covered in the very pages of The Economist. We are seeing a concentration in the number of big companies. You look at the number of public companies 20 years ago versus today. You look at the companies that are doing IPOs. Every, you look at the, uh, uh, um, all, the, all the data coming out, and specifically a conference at the University of Chicago late March, which again was covered by The Economist, in which we are in, entering a world in which competition is decreasing, and, and, and I feel like as a society, uh, more and more, we are coming to value competition less and less. 
And to me, that, that, that could be problematic. And to your point about talent, talent is truly everything. And without good talent, you can't even collaborate. And by the way, hackathons, Douglas, indeed, they are collaborative, but they're all competing for the same goal. Early in my career, I had the good fortune of, of, of being assigned to a mission-critical project, was asked by my superiors to collaborate with the team, which was an interesting experience because it kind of taught me and I learned why Batman operates alone. You realize that without good talent, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. It took a while okay. to get Robin. Well, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that as a point of order. Let's move on. We did have Robin. <laughs> okay, we're, we're getting short of time, so I'm going to take Chris's question, your question there, and that's... Is that Ashley back there? Yeah. So can we take the three questions one after the other, and if necessary, we'll, we'll deal with them in the, in the closing remarks. That was a great joke. <laughs> so are we responding to each individually? Or they're we'll see how time goes. Let's okay. see how time goes. So just, I, I used to work at Sun Microsystems, a little tiny company no, that take was uh, at one point trying to compete against the big guys. Uh, I worked for a guy named Bill Joy, who kind of invented Unix and some of the technologies that we're all using today, um, the power of the internet. And he used to have a saying that basically went along the lines of, no matter who you are, how big you are, how many smart people you employ, there are more smart people that work for somebody else. I think that really the premise of this is that competition is driving collaboration. In other words, it's what fuels the fires that demand that people collaborate and go beyond their own borders. Uh, IBM's a huge company, but we cannot out-innovate the rest of the world. We just can't. Nor can Google or Microsoft or Amazon or any of the others. The reason that I do what I'm doing in open source is so that we actually get the collaboration that allows us to derive value from people that work for other companies. And that's how we attract the best talent, is working out in the open like that. And that's a totally collaborative thing, but it's, it's driven by the competitive desire to actually improve what we're doing. But you have been humbled can first. We, 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 I think we're going to have to deal with these in the closing remarks probably. Can for the question for the gentleman here, then to Ashley. We'll see if there are any more. We'll have to wrap it up. Kind of ties you. into that last question, which is, <coughs> we, might you could see that the answer is a little different depending on the size of the organization. So if you have scale, either in terms of network effect, size of your employees, market share, et cetera, the, the extent of your collaboration and your need to collaborate is wildly different than those who are smaller and need to uh, need to achieve that scale. Ashley, now, are there any more out, out there? No, just uh, two. So we're getting these two more questions, and we'll go to the closing remarks. Okay, great. So if, if companies are embracing collaboration as something that's required to succeed in the market, then we shouldn't need regulation that encourages company or requires companies to make customer data available so that services like, like Plaid and, and even our own can, can use this data for advancing services against it. So the question would be, if you don't need cust uh, regulation to um, drive or to eliminate anti-competitive behavior and to make this data available, does that mean that we don't need this type of regulation to um, drive these data policies? OK, last remark from the floor. There was a comment made, uh, I think, by Lena about uh, competitive destruction of creative destruction and how uh, the Fortune 500 looks very different today from what it did in uh, 50 years ago. However, I would hazard that a lot of that has occurred not necessarily because of companies going out of business, but more because of companies being acquired by other companies and becoming part of their ecosystems, which in turn is a form of collaboration at some level. So maybe the, the shaping of the Fortune 500 is, is more collaboration and less creative destruction. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you all for those uh, contributions. A lot of very good points on the floor. We're now going to go to the closing remarks. These are the, where each side makes its final arguments to try and convince you of, uh, that, 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 that they should win the debate. So to start with, the closing remarks from the proposition from Doug, I think. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We've been talking about collaboration versus competition. Collaboration in the digital age is not optional. It's an imperative. It's something that must be fully adopted and embraced in order to enhance an individual, a company, or an industry's chance of survival. And to the question regarding size, it's independent of size. I think whether you're a small company or a large company, you have to lead with collaboration. I would also submit that my esteemed colleagues are confusing capitalism for competition. For in a capitalist society, we look to accumulate profits. We're in competition. Profits are ultimately eaten away. <clears throat> it's also the behaviors and the
cultures and the inter and intercompany dynamics that must continue to evolve in successful and collaborative organizations. As one of my competitor's colleagues, a Columbia Business School professor, Rita McGrath, has said, she argues that to remain head of the competition, companies should make shifts in the way that they operate, and they must set broad themes and let people experiment. They need to build strong relationships and networks. They've got to experiment, iterate, and learn, all key facets of collaboration. For the past 20 years, in his annual letter to shareholders, Jeff Bezos talks about day one. His point is that once you move to day two, stasis sets in, followed by irrelevance, decline, and ultimately death. That is why it's always day one in Amazon. In his letter this year, he speaks to the importance of understanding and embracing external trends. If you fight them, he says, probably, you're probably fighting the future. Embrace them and you have a tailwind. We must embrace this collaboration trend for open and honest collaboration is the only way to survive the digital disruption. Thank you. And the closing remarks from the opposition, please. Thank you. So just quickly to address the comment made about the Fortune 500. So that, I did say, was partly attributable to creative destruction. Even in the M&A processes, those M&A targets were actually competing against other potential targets. There were performance measures that were based on due diligence, valuations, et cetera, that those larger institutions were actually deciding whom to acquire. And then I just wanted to talk about very quickly about the advent of crowdsourcing and uh, open sourcing. Recently, there has been a lot in the press, Quantopian, which is a crowdsourced uh, quant hedge fund. And very recently, about a month ago, Bloomberg published an article, I'm going to quote it here, we're just at the beginning to give people a chance to put their knowledge to work, Quantopian CEO said. Talent is everywhere, you know, not just about hedge funds located in NYC. The startup enticed users with free seminars where professionals, academics, and amateurs alike traded quant best practices over beats and beer. Today, the platform is more Darwinian battleground than startup Shangri-La, pitting 120,000 members from 180 countries in a competition for capital and 10% of resulting profits. Collaboration alone is not the exclusive way to survive the digital disruption in financial services. And I'll conclude by saying that without fostering competition inside your company and in, uh, also outside, you'll not be compelled to perform at your best, and most likely you will begin to descend into a abyss of corporate oblivion at some point. I'll leave you with one final thought, and that is, it is said the more you sweat for peace, the less you bleed in war. And I, say, and I submit the same holds true in business. The more you work toward creating the right culture, framework, and tools to compete internally and safely be disrupted in a controlled fashion, the less you'll bleed in not becoming obsolete through violent external disruption and corporate warfare. So foster competition first, collaboration will follow uh, naturally. So with that, Lena and I will sign off and we'll thank you for your time and your vote and we look forward to <laughs> <laughs> engaging with you further. Thanks so much. <clears throat>on a difference of differences basis, or if you like, the first derivative of, uh, now uh, you're talking. Uh, 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 of the vote, I think you'd win that. So, but in a way, it, does, it doesn't really matter who's, who's won. We've heard some great arguments from both sides, really well, really well put together in tight time limits. Thank you all four of you very much, Doug, Zach, Robert, and Lena. I think it's a really big hand of applause.